how much we appreciate don't know how much we appreciate them and all the work and the dedication that they put to, the, to ISU and the College of Education. So thank you so much, Dr. Karen Ebob, for putting together this great program for them. Um, just for them to know that they are an integral part of our college and integral uh, to the success of our students. So I want to say thank you to the, all the adjuncts, faculty. I know some of them are having many jobs like juggling so many things, but they are still committed to come here and help us. So thank you. Uh, I also want to say, take this opportunity because Dr. Karen Ebobi is going to continue to work with you as you need the help throughout the semester. We also want your feedback. And if you could share your feedback uh, of what we are doing well and what we are not doing well through Dr. Ebobi, she'll be able to bring the feedback to us, to our leadership team, so that we can improve what we do you know, in our classrooms, uh, in our environment and everything. So take the opportunity to provide us with feedback so that at least we can also grow as a college. Um, if there's any support you need, it can be support with um, uh, additional tools for your classrooms if you're teaching online. Make sure you tell Dr. FLB and Sheldon to see what is feasible for us to help you with. Um, other than that, I'll be here just for 30 minutes. I have another meeting. I want to say thank you for this great program and thank you, Dr. Epobi, for inviting me. And also thank you for the faculty, like Dr. Lin, who are part of this program. Uh, you make this program strong. Thank you, Dr. Jacobson. I can see you. Thank you. Thank you. If I meet someone in terms of our, our faculty, know that uh, my screen is not doing well. Uh, I appreciate you. Dr. Wood, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. I leave this time for Dr. Apple B so that at least you have enough time for introductions uh, in any other thing that you want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Atuli. And I, I didn't give you a proper introduction. Um, you have thanked all of us, and I would very much like to thank you. We are very excited and honored to have Dr. Esther Natuli um, serving in our interim dean role this year. She is the lead of the college. She is the lead of the faculty, the students and the staff, and I, I cannot think of a better person to be doing this. Um, Dr. Natuli has been a faculty member in the College of Education for a very long time. She has mentored faculty, she has mentored students, she has mentored GAs, um, and she has mentored me in lots of ways. And so I just want to let her know how grateful we are for her leadership and for stepping in. So. So thank you, Esther, very much. Uh, thank you, Joshua Karen Epobi. You are so you are you are very kind because you have been my dean before. So <laughs> my provost before. So thank you for your kind words. And I still look up to you and uh, everything that we are gonna learn from you this semester. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Dean Atuli. So we'll go ahead and get started. And I am going to can everybody see the PowerPoint? Just raise your hand if you can say, okay, fantastic. So really quickly, I wanna run through the goals for today. I have posted on your Google invitation. You can find a link to the slides for this presentation and there are some resources embedded in the slides. So um, that will help you get access to that. If for some reason you uh, don't have access to that or you lose access to that, don't hesitate to contact me um, and I'll get, I'll get these over to you as quickly as possible. Um, and also the agenda is also on your Google calendar. So if you wanna look at those resources and follow along that way, or if you wanna just let me go ahead um, and follow along um, with the Zoom presentation, either one is great. So we'll start off today with introductions, um, and then we're gonna move into uh, Dr. Emma Wood, who is our assistant dean, uh, is going to be talking to you all about instructional technology resources for teaching and, and the support that you have in the College of Education and on campus for that. Um, and then Mr. Sheldon Harris, who is our coordinator of faculty and technology in the College of Education, is here to talk to us about the technology support that you might need, um, FERPA pieces. So if you haven't heard of FERPA, uh, and this is your first introduction to it, um, this is really important information, working with students in higher education for you to know about. And then he's also going to talk about something that is critically important, and that is parking. So if you need to park on campus, 
Sheldon's going to talk to you about what you need to know about that, um, how to get your parking passes and those types of things. I'm going to talk a little bit about the functions and the elements of the course syllabus. I'll give, just give you a very brief, um, some brief introductions to the syllabi, some of the policies that you might want to put on your syllabus, um, and give you some background information there. And then I'll also, I'll be talking uh, a little bit about some of the ISU policies and procedures that we've got lots of ISU policy and procedures. And I actually see Blake Christensen on here, who is our chief legal counsel here. Um, Blake can tell you everything you need to know about all policies and procedures at ISU, but we are only going to, and Blake, don't worry, you, you don't have to speak in any of this, but um, I have, I have handpicked a few of the policies and procedures that I think will be helpful for you as you're working with students, just making sure you have access to those um, and um, you've got those at your fingertips if you need them. And then We'll wrap up with any questions you have. I can guarantee uh, with this group of uh, amazing faculty and highly intelligent people, you all will have questions that I don't have the answers to. So I'm going to lean heavily on my colleagues here in the College of Education. And if we don't have answers, we will find those answers for you. Um, so we will go ahead and get started with some introductions. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go around my Zoom room. I'm gonna start with the College of Education leadership team that's here, um, ask you to introduce yourself and following Dean Natuli's uh, very good uh, momentum from the beginning, tell me one thing really cool and fun you did over the summer. So um, Dr. Wood, you are first up. All right, well, thank you. Uh, this summer, so I'm an assistant dean, and a lot of what I look at is assessment and uh, programmatic assessment and, and helping our, our degree programs move forward. And uh, this summer, probably the, the best things that I did was spend a week in Colorado and a week up in Island Park. So... Those were my highlights this summer and a lot of time in the shade under my my uh, newly put up pergola with a book in hand. So I, I enjoyed that this summer. Nice. I knew you looked rested and recovered, Emma. Yeah. So great. Thank you. Sheldon. My name is Sheldon Harris. I'm the manager of IT and facilities. What did I do that was fun this summer? We went and saw the Big Boy Steam Locomotive, which is the largest operating steam locomotive, uh, go from McCammon to Soda Springs and chased it that, that length of road. So that was fun. Very cool. That was a I didn't get to see that. And I'm disappointed I was out of town. So I bet that was a pretty cool experience. Yeah. Nice. Thanks, Sheldon. Dr. Lin. Hello, everyone. My name is Suyaning. Nice to see you all. Back here, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm the I'm clinical professor in teaching and educational studies, and I'm the EDUC twenty two hundred four course the lead. So that's why I'm here. And usually I have a couple, uh, Asian faculty in teaching two hundred four. I already met one of the new instructor last week to talk about in the EDUC 204. And uh, last semester, we um, decided that we are going to have a course meeting this semester. Um, so nice to see you. Okay. One of the most exciting thing I did is uh, go back to Taiwan to visit my family. And the other one is I moved. We moved to Pocat uh, from Pocatello to Idaho Falls. Oh, I did see that. Congratulations. And that's a kind of the greatest opportunity we had. We cannot pass because we just bought the house across the street of my son's house. Very good. Very good. That does not make for a relaxing summer, moving your house, but it does make for an exciting summer. So good. Yeah, exciting and very tiring. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Lin. Great to have you here today. Dr. Curry. Yes. Um, I'm John Curry. Uh, I'm a professor uh, in organizational learning and performance. My area is instructional design and technology. I'm the department chair in that department, but I'm also the associate dean. And uh, 
So as long as Dr. Natuli um, thinks I'm doing okay, I'll be her interim associate dean and uh, trying to hold down the fort for her that way. And I appreciate Dr. Appleby, who's kind of splitting some duties with me and making my life easier as I juggle two roles. And anybody who knows me already knows what I do in every spare moment. And that is I am on the golf course. That's what I do as much as possible. Awesome. And Dr. Curry, thank you for taking on the interim associate dean role, as well as the department chair role. That Those are two heavy responsibilities on their own. So together, amazing. So we are very grateful to have you in that position. Thanks. Dr. Jacobson. I didn't know I'd be that fast. Um, uh, I'm Brenda Jacobson. I'm a cl clinical professor in organizational learning and performance, um, specifically for CTE, career and technical education. And um, I was kind of grounded this summer. <laughs> and so um, my funnest thing has been that my granddaughter keeps she's able to come and she's she's still of the age that she wants to play waitress and she wants to, she wants to play shopping so um she would take my order and then go fix it <laughs> fantastic could could I borrow her for a little while I know. for somebody to come over and take my order <laughs> I, I miss her I miss I when she leaves <laughs> how old is she she's nine Oh, fantastic. Well, if you have to be grounded for the summer to have an awesome nine-year-old running around, that makes it a little bit easier. Yes, def most definitely. So thanks. Oh, and welcome everybody. And thank you, Dr. Natuli and Dr. Curry. Um, I, I just, it's going to be a great, it's going to be a great year. Agreed. Agreed. And Dean Natuli, I know you've already introduced. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I just wanted to say um, thank you so much. Um, uh, like you have said, I've been a professor in this college for a long time. But it, to be honest with you, my success in everything that I've done is because of this team. And I wanted to tell those who are here today that Dr. Brenda Jacobson was my mentor and my lead teacher in one of my courses when I started at ISU, which means I can I, I can never be anything without them without uh, Dr. Lynn, Dr. Uh, 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 Jacobson, because they know my, 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 my shortfalls, everything as a teacher, and they molded me to be who I am. So you are in a good place today. So thank you, Dr. Jacobson, for everything. I'm still your student. <laughs> I think learning is our professional activity, right? We are all still students of what we do. Uh, the older I get, the more I know I, how much I don't know. And so I think that's an important thing to learn as we go through. Um, for the sake of time, what I'd like to do is I would like to now go through all of our participants. If you could just tell us your name and the department that you'll be adjuncting for. And then if you wanna pop into the chat, something fun that you did during the summer, that would be fantastic too. And then we can move on so that I don't take up too much of your time this afternoon. So I will go through who's on my Zoom screen. So Christina Brinkerhoff, you are up. Hello, everybody. It's nice to meet all of you. Hopefully I got the directions correctly. So Christina Brinkerhoff, you'll also hear it or see it with Christy. Um, I will be with the Graduate Department of School Psychology and Educational Leadership this fall. I've taught a few other adjunct courses in that same department in previous semesters, but this is my first orientation, so I'm excited about that. And Dr. Uh, Appleby, I hope that's all you asked for. I'll that is all. Somewhere in the chat. Perfect. That's perfect. Thank you, Dr. Brinkerhoff. That's that was a wonderful introduction. So everybody else knows what to do. Glad to have you on board. Kinsey Isham. Hi, I'm Kinsey, and I'm just a GA for the Human Performance Sports Studies. Kinsey, great to have you here. And not just a GA, we think of our GAs as our colleagues. And so we're really excited to have you on board. And um, I'm very excited to work with you in my department and all of the other GAs from the department who are here. So speaking of, uh, Allie Whitmer. Um, I'm Allie Whitmer and I'm also a GA and it's my second se semester as a GA. Fantastic. Great to have you here, Allie. Thanks. Blake 
Christensen. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Happy to jump in here and see everyone. I, uh, yeah, current employee here and have been asked to help out with a couple of classes on legal topics. What we're hoping to do is utilize myself and a few others from the uh, general counsel office to hit a bunch of legal topics for the College of Business and in the law and higher education class. So we are excited to uh, continue our efforts to teach legal topics on campus and help out with some classes. Great. So awesome to have you aboard, Blake. That is going to be so helpful for College of Education, College of Business um, to have your legal expertise available. Sydney Stratinger. Oh, sorry. My dog just barked, but um, I'm Sid. I'm a GA in the Human Performance and Sports Science Department. Great. Good to have you, Sid. And what is your dog's name since she introduced herself? <laughs> Um, his name's Rip. He's a chocolate labradoodle. Nice. <laughs> give him a give him a scritch for us. Uh, Sabrina Schupman. Hi, my name's Sabrina. I'm also a GA in the HPSS department this semester. Great. Good to have you aboard, Sabrina, and have you here tonight. Michaela McGee. Hi, I'm also a GA as well, and I'll be working closely with Dr. Myers and Chad Robinson in the exercise physiology lab. Great, good to have you aboard, Michaela. And I might be wrong, but you also are in the MPH program, is that correct? That is correct, yes. Fantastic, good, good to have you here. Thanks. Kathy Levitt. Hi, um, I am working with Dr. Curry and teaching instructional design and technology to master's students, so. Fantastic. Great to have you here, Kathy. And Kathy, you are also an amazing resource in our Instructional Technology Resource Center. So yeah, I do work at the ITRC. So if you have questions about syllabi and getting things on Moodle, you'll probably end up coming down and talking with me in the faculty lab. So fantastic. I will be there soon. So I'm sure everybody else will too. Well, yeah, I'm still in Canada on vacation. So maybe when I get back. Very good. Thanks, Kathy. Caitlin Rizzo. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm also a GA for the HPSS program, and this is my first time as a GA. Excellent. So good to have you here. And Michaela McGee. Oh, I've already gone. Oh, sorry, Michaela. I just no, had a different corner. Um, I'm just doubly happy that you're here. So welcome <laughs> twice. Thank you. Appreciate it. You bet. Dr. Luann Ross. Hi, this is my first semester of teaching uh, methods of training in the fall semester with the Department of Organizational Learning and Performance in the College of Education. I've been teaching a grant writing class in the spring, and I have to tell you that the ISU students are the most inspirational, most amazing group of students I've ever worked with. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Um, and I agree with you. There is something very special about our ISU students, and I feel the same. So thanks for saying that. Elise Morgan, did I say that right? Is it Elise or Alice? It's Elise. Elise, great. Hi. Um, I'm coming back to teach my third round of secondary art methods and materials for the College of Education. Excellent. Well, Elise, thank you for um, hanging in there with us and being here. Yeah, I love it. You know? And so um, if there are things that, you know, having, being a, a seasoned veteran as a uh, adjunct, if there are things that we're missing in this orientation, please let me know and we'll add that. So I value your input. And then I think last but not least is Julian Duffy. Julian, are you there? Well, we will go back to Julian, and I think maybe I did miss somebody, Kiera Stommel. Hi, I'm Kiera, um, and I am an adjunct professor for the College of Education. This is round three um, in the Department of Special Education. Fantastic. Great to have you aboard, Kiera. And similar to what I said to Elise, please feel free to chime in with some pieces that would be really helpful for us to add and include in some resources. So did I miss anybody? We've got everybody. Um, I realized um, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Karen Appleby. 
I am a professor in the Department of Human Performance and Sports Studies, and I am also teaching in the Educational Leadership Department this semester, and I serve as our coordinator of faculty development. Um, I feel a little bit uh, new, met, like many of you here, because I have been in an administrative position in academic affairs for the past four years. So it's really good to be back home in my College of Education home and back teaching. And I'm very excited to get back into the classroom. But I'm kind of brushing off all the old rusty bits and putting the syllabus together and trying to remember, you know, all of the exciting things about being a teacher. So um, really good to be with you today. So I am going to turn it over now to uh, Dr. Wood, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the instructional technology resources we have available for teaching. So Dr. Wood. Well, thank you. I mean, we have a resident expert with us, with uh, Kathy. Uh, but just so that all of you know, as you're putting your courses together, we do have our Instructional Technology Resource Center here on campus, and you can access them both uh, in person or you can set up Zoom meetings. And gave you some links to the video training library. If you're wondering about how you might um, set up your grade book, how you might create some interactive activities because you're teaching primarily online asynchronously, or if you're interested in uh, different types of activities or assessments that you might do, the video training library is a really good resource to see a walkthrough on how you can set that up inside your course. Uh, we also have the tiger tracks with uh, di just different how-to articles uh, you can go in there and you can say, how do I set up my grade book? And you'll find some resources there that will support you in that way, particularly if uh, Moodle is a new learning management system for you. And then we have the phone number. That's the right phone number, right, Kathy? That's the phone number for the ITRC. Yeah, that's and, the right phone number. And Excellent. It's if you go to our the website at the top, you can also make an on-demand appointment, whether in person or Zoom, with the next available instructional designer. And so we are very grateful for the, uh, the expertise that the ITRC provides to our faculty uh, here at ISU. Thank you, Dr. Wood. I appreciate that. And I... I um have been very grateful to the ITRC throughout the many years that I've been teaching here. Um, I've learned lots of cool things, um, lots of ways to make even in-person classes. Some of you might be thinking, oh, why do I need a Moodle page if I'm teaching an in-person class? Um, what I have found is that every faculty member gets a Moodle page, of course, whether no matter what no modality you're teaching in, but your Moodle page can really supplement what you're doing in in-person classes as well as online and blended classes. So please take advantage of this resource. They're fantastic and available. Um, and Kathy, I just want to open it up to you. Is there anything else that you might, I didn't give you any pre-warning for this. It's okay. For orientation, but I just, is there anything else we might want to tell them? There's lots of support materials as well on the ITRC page. Um, you can find syllabus templates. You can find different things to help you kind of plan out your course, like a course alignment map and just different things to different resources to kind of help you visualize the whole the whole big picture of the 17 weeks. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I know that we're going to save questions to the end, but I know that Emma has to leave a little bit early. So I want to see if there are any questions specifically for Emma and this information that she just presented before she goes. If you have a question, you can just chime in or raise your hand. Either one is fine. Okay. Well, if you're like me, all the questions will come as soon as we finish this meeting. And so you can certainly send those to me and I'll get those answered um, by Emma or whoever can help us find the answer to the question that you have. So Emma, thank you very much. I am gonna turn it now over to Sheldon and Sheldon's gonna talk about all of these things that you see on this slide. So Sheldon, are you okay with me advancing your slides? I sure am. Okay, just- oh, Let's go to the next slide. Okay. So 
I provide technical support in the education building, Albion Hall, and Reed Gym. And if you're teaching physically in those classrooms, those are under my area. Uh, if you're teaching in Reed Gym, the four main classrooms just got a complete technology overhaul this uh, past week, and uh, we're still working out a few of the bugs. So if there's if you're teaching over there, please let us know. So reach out to me, COE help at isu.edu if you have issues with uh, a class physical classroom you're teaching in in one of these buildings, uh, issues with classroom computers, or if you have been assigned a COE computer, like the HBSS GTAs all got brand new laptops today and your mice should be here tomorrow. Um, reach out to me for support with those. There's my phone number and my email address. And I'm usually in the office from seven in the morning till 4 p.m. Um, after hours, go ahead and call. It usually forwards to my cell phone or send me an email and I'll try and get back to you. Um, I've been out of the office uh, a little bit and uh, with COVID, so I haven't been around too much and probably won't be around for a few more days, but I'll try and help you remotely. Next slide, please. Technical support for non-classroom issues. So if you're having trouble logging into my ISU, you're having trouble logging into Moodle, Gmail, you can't remember your ISU username, that stuff, give the ITS help desk, service desk, they go by both, a call at the phone number there, help at isu.edu, and reach out to them because they, they control all of that. If you're finding that you need free access to Microsoft Office 365. You can reach out to them as well. Um, assistance with grade entry, banner, et cetera. Um, and if you're not sure where to send a request, send it to me anyway, and I'll make sure it gets put in the right queue. Next slide, please. So some things that we have to emphasize is when working with students, Always try to use your ISU email account when possible, uh, especially with the students. Don't use your personal email address or your work email address. Um, yeah, just keep it under ISU. And one thing we have to remind people is uh, avoid sending grades through email whenever possible. There have been issues in the past. It hasn't been a big deal lately, but still just be careful. Grades should always be posted in the middle grade book. Any questions this far? Okay, next slide. So FERPA is the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. And it's from 1974. It's a federal law that protects the privacy of student education records. If you're not familiar with it, you should take a few minutes and sit down and re read about it on the internet. And educational institutions have to, are bound by these regulations, and they apply to students in attendance, regardless if they're under 18 or age and former students. Next slide. It covers more than just transcripts and grades. Sometimes we think that, that only the grades and the transcripts are protected, but it covers any of that record. So disciplinary records, class schedules, financial information, even medical records for student health. Um, a student's academic performance should never be the topic of water cooler talk. This happens, this pops up, faculty will be sitting around talking about people and students and it happens. Um, next slide, please. Some do nots. If you're asked for information by off-campus inquiries, such as, I don't know, parents will reach out to faculty and ask them for information about their students. You can't give that information to the parents. Um, refer all those requests to pro probably the office of the registrar. Um, legitimate educational interest. Um, not everybody has legitimate educational interest in those students and their information. Um, do not circulate a printed class list 
especially if it contains student ID. So you gotta be careful with that. Uh, uh, do not post grades or other confidential information in, well, they should be in Moodle, but don't post them outside the classroom door or your office door. Um, be careful leaving papers and things for students to pick up. If you do grade things that they need to be picked up, leave them with the department admin assistant. Um, most of you will be using your own personal computers. Just be careful that you don't leave confidential information displayed on the computer or easily accessible by family members if, if you're not using an ISU computer. Um, uh, do not view student data to which you may have access or request data from others unless you have a legitimate educational interest based on your assigned responsibilities. We see this come, come up with uh, student employees where they'll be like, their friend will be like, hey, Karen, you know, can you look up, uh, can, can, can you look up so-and-so's grade and see how they're doing in such and such a class or whatever? So we don't do that. Next slide, please. Here are some things that you can do. Um, make sure that computer programs are, that contain student information, such as Moodle, your Excel spreadsheet, that you're doing stuff in, whatever. Make sure that, that you lock your screen or close it down. Um, make sure you keep your records in a secure location if they're paper and that they're disposed of by deleting when we're done or, or shredding. Um, do get written permission from the student before sharing any educational record information with outside persons. Um, and down on the bottom there, Preferably store student work information in, we've been saying ISU Google Docs is okay, but with some of the storage restrictions they've done, it's better to keep it in box. So if you're saving student information, student assignments, whatever, and it needs to be saved somewhere, please store it in the ISU box. If you don't have an account, reach out to the help desk and get one um, to store all those materials. Please don't store them on your personal hard drive or your personal thumb drive. Um, just in case something happens, it's better to have it in the cloud. Next slide. Any questions on FERPA before we get to parking? Okay. Let's talk about parking. It's free after 4 p.m. Monday through Friday in Pocatello. You are responsible for securing a permit if you need to park on campus from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Parking questions, concerns, you can go to isu.edu slash parking. And I will conclude with, yes, the ITRC is very helpful. Please reach out to them. I've, I've been an adjunct instructor on and off for quite a few years now, and I never do. I'm one of those, oh, I'll figure it out myself. And, and so, yes, I encourage that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sheldon. Appreciate your expertise and your plug for the ITRC. Um, I want to add, if if uh, it's okay, a couple of other things about FERPA, just, just to reiterate some of the important pieces that Sheldon just mentioned. Um, for those of you who may have worked in a K-12 setting, um, higher ed setting is much different because in a K-12 setting with students who are under 18, parents, you can share information with parents in a higher education setting, you, unless you explicitly have the permission of the student, you may not share that information with parents. So um, this can cause, I don't, this doesn't happen very often. Parents do not call faculty very often. Um, it does have, it has happened to me a handful of times in my 20 year career. Um, and the best way to handle that is always to just tell the parent, you know, I can't disclose that information and then go to your department chair. And I will say as an, as an adjunct, the best thing for you to always do, and we'll talk a little bit about this with student issues, is um, you know, always talk to the student, always, you know, never you don't have to, you know, say you won't talk to a parent, but you certainly don't have to talk to a parent um, if you don't want to. And you we'll always want to make sure that your department chair knows. Um, and so your department chair is really your touch point uh, person in 
any student issues, um, any issues that may arise. So make sure that you go to that person um, for those types of questions. Um, another thing that I wanna put an exclamation point on that Sheldon brought up is because we have GAs here who might be sharing an office. It's one thing, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to keep student information um, confidential when you have your own office and your own computer and you can close everything down. When you're sharing an office with six, seven other people, it becomes a little bit more difficult. So you really have to make sure that um, you take all those precautions that Sheldon was talking about, shutting down your computer, using your password, those types of things, not talking about students because you will have students who are in lots of different classes. A lots of Lots of you will have the same student in different classes. And unless there is a reason, an educational reason to know, um, you should not be discussing that student's academic progress. So, um, and I don't want to put him on the spot, but Blake, is there any other burning thing? Blake is a, also a FERPA expert. Is there any other burning thing that our adjuncts might need to know about FERPA? You know, I, I, I think you guys have covered it really well. The kinds of questions that we get a lot from folks on campus are usually around unique situations. They think, ooh, you know, I heard about FERPA, but I don't know how this fits. That's fine. That happens all the time. If you have a sense of that red flag to start asking questions, that's perfect. Come talk to, you know, talk to department chairs, talk to colleagues and peers, talk to Karen, come talk to the legal office. We can help people think through specific situations and help make the right decisions on the front end. That's probably one of the biggest takeaways across campus is if you're unsure about something, just ask. Well, there are so many helpful people here who will help point you in the right direction. Um, and you know, if, if you're going to err on a side of something, err on the side of privacy. You think, I'm not sure if I can share this. I'm not sure I can tell this to that person. Just don't. Let them know. I, I'm not sure if I can tell you that yet. I'll find some answers and I'll come back and, and then we'll talk some more. But um, FERPA sounds, I think, scarier than it is. Uh, you know, it's it there. There's a lot of leeway for people who also work here. If someone is an employee and they have a legitimate educational interest in knowing something, the bar is fairly low, uh, right? Sometimes we get. When I first got here, we'd sometimes have faculty members, and they would call and they'd say, "I have this student, and they're really struggling, and I know that they're in this class. Uh, boy, I wish I could talk to that professor about the student." I'd say, well. Why couldn't you talk to them? You're both employees and you both have a legit education, legitimate educational interest. Talk to them. They say, oh, really? Ah, oh, that's great. And they would go and talk and they would help the student. That's beautiful. FERPA is not there to prevent those sorts of conversations. So um, err on the side of privacy. Do the amazing things you guys are doing. And when a question comes up, we're happy to help. Awesome. Thank you, Blake. I, I appreciate um, you adding your input. And um, Blake said something really important. One of the reasons we're having this meeting today is we want you to know that you have a network of support, not only within the college, but across the entire institution. And I know it sounds scary uh, to go to a department chair. It's not. Or to go to a dean. It's not. Or to go to the office of legal counsel. Oh, my. You're meeting Blake right now. You couldn't find a, a kinder, more helpful person. So you just have a really good network of support. I love that idea of error, you know, kind of that thought process of erring um, on the side of privacy, um, but reach out with any questions you have. Um, so there's not a day in my professional career um, and probably all of you all as well that I don't have a question. So a question doesn't come up that I don't know the answer to and I need to reach out to my friends. So this is a good network here for you to start with. So Sheldon, thank you. Appreciate your help, and I'm sorry you're feeling so crummy with COVID and that you're here. Wow. Thank you. So we're going to move on, and I'm going to actually wrap up our day today and, and uh, want to give you some time for questions, but I wanted to talk about the syllabus. Um, and the syllabus, some of you probably have already started working on your syllabi. Some of you may be just starting your syllabus. Um, the syllabus is uh, a... I actually do research on syllabi and the uh, role that a syllabus will play in a student's learning and motivation in a class. And so what I'm going to share with you today is a very truncated uh, portion of a presentation that I have given for our program for instructional effectiveness, which I'll give a plug for that. It's a university program that's open to all faculty adjuncts, GAs, full-time faculty. Um, if you're teaching a class, you can uh, certainly uh, attend 
program for instructional effectiveness, or we call it PI events. And it's all about great ideas in teaching, different strategies for teaching, almost like a teaching and learning center. And uh, I gave a presentation on creating a uh, learner-centered syllabus uh, for PI a few years ago. And so you can find, I've linked to the um, PowerPoint presentation and I've linked to the presentation itself if you have an extra hour in your day and you wanna watch that. Um, but those certainly are um, resources available to you. Both of those links will drive you to the PI website. So you'll know when those events are happening. Um, and I will keep you abreast on when those events are happening as well. Um, so those are these top two resources. This bottom resource, we're gonna go over this at the end of the presentation today, um, is a helpful resource that we've developed in the Program for Instructional Effectiveness for faculty to use that have various policies, statements that are student-centered might help students that you can choose to put on your syllabus. So that's at your disposal um, too, and we'll go through that in just a moment. So um, let's just do a little activity really quickly. Um, I'm gonna go to the chat and I want everybody to just write down maybe one word about what is the purpose of a syllabus. And I'll, we'll, we'll take one minute. We'll just do a quick, quick hit, one minute. Great, to inform, do process. It's a guide to provide guidance. Anything else? A couple other pieces in there. Communication, excellence, reassurance. I like that, good, good. Expectation, structure of the class, excellent. How about just one more maybe? A roadmap. Oh, Brenda, what a great way to end on. A roadmap to the class. Yes, this, the purpose of the syllabus is all of those things. Um, and, you know, really the functions, all of those things fit into the umbrella of sort of three different areas. A syllabus is this the first, it's sort of your first get, getting to know point between a student and an instructor. Um, it provides information for the student about the class. It sets those performance expectations and it helps the student get to know you a little bit. Um, the syllabus is gonna be different based on different department procedures and policies. So one of the first things that I wanna let you know is some of your departments may have a standardized syllabus. So please check with your department chairs about, you know, do, are you teaching a class that has a standardized syllabus? You might have accreditation requirements or department level requirements that you absolutely have to have. And so make sure you touch base with your department chairs about that. But you have a lot of flexibility and creativity uh, regarding the syllabus. And what we're going to talk about today, these are just some of the areas we think about information, performance expectations, getting to know the instructor. These are some of the things that you might want to include on a syllabus. So in information, obviously course requirements. So what are the requirements for the courses? There might be prerequisites, there might be books, um, those types of things. Calendar and due dates, that's that roadmap that Dr. Jacobson was talking about. Those course policies, as Blake brought up, kind of the due process for a student, you know, what is your attendance policy? What's your late work policy? Those types of things. And then course goals and objectives. Um, I'm a sports psychologist. That's my background and training. Um, I believe that part of what I do as a teacher is motivate. I mean, obviously it's to educate, but it's also to motivate. Part of motivating students is helping them to understand what I'm trying to teach them in the class, what I want them to get out of the class, and then how they can apply that to their professional lives. And I think a lot of times um, we don't do that and students kind of lose motivation. You know, why am I taking this class? And so we are sort of that guide on the side to help students recognize the importance of, of classes in their personal and their professional lives. Of course, we wanna communicate the performance expectations grade policies, assignment descriptions, and purpose. We'll talk a little bit about this. As I said, professional development. So why am I asking you to do some of these things? You know, one of the things that I always um, do, and especially in my undergraduate classes, and I do it a lot in my grad classes, but for sure my undergraduate classes is I always have a group assignment, whether it's a presentation or a paper, 
how much do my students love when I tell them they're going to have a big group assignment? Do they love it? Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Yeah, they generally do not love it. And, you know, there are all sorts of challenges with group assignments. They're not easy for faculty. They're harder to grade. They're harder to coordinate. You've got all sorts of performance management problems. But why do we require students to learn how to work in groups? Anybody, this is this is an open question. Why, why do we want students to learn how to work in groups? Can I answer, Karen? Please, Blake. My job every day on campus is to help people problem solve, and we never problem solve in a silo. We bring people together, we collaborate, we discuss together, we argue, and then we come up with a solution as a team. And uh, I, I imagine, I hope the point Karen is making is that we really need to have our students learn how to collaborate, how to, to, to someone just put in utilize strengths and weaknesses for better outcome. Absolutely. So important in, in the workforce at our institution and, and everywhere else. So That's right, Blake. Thank you so much. And maybe I could have you come into my class and provide that rationale to my students because that was quite compelling. Um, yeah, there is no profession that you will go into that you don't you aren't going to have to work into a group. Now, I, I know that everybody in here knows this, but our students don't. So providing that compelling rationale, I know it's more difficult, but that's where good learning happens. So um, providing them the rationale for professional development, not only what we are doing in the assignment, but the modality of the assignment. Um, what are the learning outcomes of the course? So that's all in performance expectations. And I also think the syllabus, especially a learner-centered syllabus, a syllabus that's student-friendly, helps a student get to know the instructor. Um, and it helps a student, there should be a little bit about your teaching philosophy and style in your syllabi. Um, your interest in your motivation and your background for teaching this class. Um, your interest in student engagement. Why are you interested um, in having, in learning from them? You know, one of the things I say in all of my classes, and I'm sure you do all as well, is I'll learn as much from my students as hopefully they'll learn from me. And this is a co-learning process that we're doing here. Um, while I'm guiding it, um, I'm interested in your engagement because this is an experience for us all. And then of course, approachability. So all of those things um, are things to think about. You know, maybe approachability is office hours. What happens if uh, a student can't make your office hours? What's the process there? Um, and I hope it's not, well, too bad, so sad. You know, you don't get to talk to me. It's, you know, well, we'll find a time, contact me, we'll find a time. So what's when can you, um, Sheldon did a great job of saying, you know, these are the times when I'm in the office. If you need to get in touch with me after office hours, do this. And, and by the way, there's no expectation for you to be on 24 seven at all. Um, it's just to lay out those boundaries of professional expectation of when can I, can students get in touch with you? When can they expect to hear back from you? Um, what's the best way of getting in touch with you? So uh, any questions about sort of those general pieces in the syllabus or additions from my experts here in the audience? Karen, can I bring one up that we Please, see? Please, Blake, yes. Oh, this is, I'm not supposed to be intruding on Karen's thing here. I just apparently can't stop talking. Um, one that we get a lot of questions around and 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 I... I'm sorry if I missed this. We get a lot around uh, the use of AI and how to how to do that on the syllabus. And some of the the really helpful ones that I have seen recently, um, some will specifically say the intent of this course is dialogue, independent thought, et cetera. And so using chat GPT AI is antithetical to the course and you absolutely cannot use it. I've seen others that have said uh, there may be opportunities to effectively use chat GPT, AI, whatever it is. However, you need to cite to it and specifically state how it was used. And some have even said you have to put the exact uh, input that you put in. You have to cite that in whatever you're doing, right? So uh, we're starting to see folks that are really thinking through, can it be used at all? Should it? How would you guide students on it? Uh, what are your requirements for it? And then spelling that out in the syllabus is really helpful because on the, the back end, you don't say anything. And then a student does something and we're trying to decide, well, now is that a student conduct issue, an academic integrity issue? Is it going to get appealed to the board? 
we need something to point to to show that they should have known what those rules were. So the more you can get that in and think that through, that's really helpful. I came across one professor that he just owned it. He said uh, he was teaching a, like a big data course, lots of Excel. He said, AI is your friend. I'm going to teach you what you need to know and what the, how to get there. And then together, we're going to learn how to use chat GPT to make your life easier and do all this analysis. And you can absolutely use it, right? Different contexts that work differently for him. But we should all be thinking about what does that look like for the courses that you are doing? Blake, I'm so glad. Thank you so much for, for bringing that up. Um, because obviously, AI is going to be a huge part of how we teach and how we communicate with students. We do have, and on that sheet that I'm going to, that I shared with you in that earlier resource, and I'll share with you again, um, we do have a faculty um, academic integrity council that has some blanket statements for use of AI in a class. You know, if it's, as Blake's saying, if it's full use of AI and faculty are saying, yes, you can use this, just properly cite, there's a statement for that that you can just cut and paste into your syllabus, or if there's a there is no reason why you could, you, I don't want you using AI, there's a statement for that. And so one of the things I would suggest that you do is first check with your department chair, is there a department policy on AI? I will tell you at the institutional level, there is no institutional level policy on AI. We have academic affairs has given the university and the colleges and the departments the ownership over um, really figuring out what is best for their disciplines, and for their departments, for their faculty, and for their students. So talk with your department chair, but I think that's a great thing to put in your syllabus and to talk to your students about. So moving on, uh, just a little bit about the learner-centered syllabus. Um, so a syllabus can come across as kind of like a dry recipe for chocolate chip cookies, right? It's like a cup of flour, a cup of sugar, well, that's maybe too much sugar, but I like you know lots of sugar. Lots of chocolate chips, mix, bake, boom, you're good. Um, you could do a syllabus like that. There's nothing wrong with it, as long as you got the information in there. Um, but because I really believe that a syllabus is a little bit more about students getting to know you and building some culture in the class, um, think about the way you say things in a syllabus. And that presentation that I linked to earlier will give you some examples uh, for example, like how to talk about office hours, you can talk about it in a you know very concise professional way, which is fine, or you can talk about it in more of a learner-centered way. It will give you some examples of, of what I'm talking about here. But a learner-centered syllabi, you might want to just look through your syllabus um, for your tone and for some of the things that you say, really encourages students to take responsibility for their learning. I mean, remember, these are college students, those of you who are new to teaching, um, they have a big responsibility in this social contract of learning in higher education. So this isn't all about me just filling, you know, the teacher just filling you with information, but you also have a responsibility to be prepared to show up in class, those types of things. To know what is required to achieve for success. And then, as I said earlier, to recognize and identify skills they'll learn to develop. So think about language that you use in the learner-centered syllabus. Language should be positive. Um, challenging, but encouraging, and should absolutely be inclusive. And so um, I have a very uh, close colleague uh, who we've developed many courses together. I always have her kind of take a look at my syllabi. Um, she looks through it uh, and I do the same for her. And we just kind of, you know, you know, is this language inclusive? Is it encouraging? Is it challenging? Those types of things. So, and it can also convey compassion and enthusiasm. And students have, research has shown that students who have faculty who use a learner-centered syllabus feel these things about their faculty, okay? That they're caring, they're creative, they're reliable, they're enthusiastic, they're approachable. All of those things make a big difference in the culture of a class. Um, so think about what you're saying in the syllabus and how you're developing it, but also think about how you're saying it, how that would come across to a student. Um, and I am a not, by the way, suggesting that you make your syllabus. Yes, late assignments all day long. We'll take them. I have something in my, my syllabus that says I do not accept late assignments, period. However, if you have a life circumstance, please let me know beforehand. You know, those kinds of things. So, I mean, you can be very strict um, in your course policies and procedures, but also be very caring um, and very honest. So, 
Any questions about any of those pieces? And then we'll talk sort of nuts and bolts of syllabi here in just a second. Okay, great. So basic syllabus information. Again, I wanna reiterate, please go back to your department chairs to see if you have a standardized syllabus. Um, that will also help with some of this basic information. But this is, this is if you just look at a syllabus from like a, a content perspective, this is the stuff you should have on there. Instructor information, that includes your ISU email. Um, one thing, again, that I wanna reiterate that Sheldon mentioned earlier, do let your students know that if you're using a Moodle page, which I'm hoping that you are, they must use their ISU email or they have to make sure that the email they're using is connected to their ISU email so they're getting that information. So it's really critically important because if you have a student who's not using his or her ISU email, they're not gonna get any of your announcements from Moodle. Um, so make sure that students know that. Um, you do not, uh, you're, you can share your cell phone information. I am not a faculty member that shares my cell number. I tell my students the best way to reach me is via email and I check it a lot. So, you know, those are just things that I tell my students. You do you, figure out what's best for you um, and what's most appropriate. Course description, objectives, readings, assignment descriptions, course calendar, policies and procedures, which we're going to talk about in just a second. And then student support resources. And there is only one required student support resource that we're gonna talk about in just a second. Um, but there are a host of other student support resources that you certainly can include. So any questions about, or anything that I might be missing on this basic syllabus information? Okay, this is pretty standard stuff. Um, and then course policies and procedures. Here are some policies and procedures that you might want to include in your syllabus. Please ignore these numbers up here. This is just directly from that presentation I gave and some of the pieces were numbered. Um, I always suggest an attendance policy is a really good policy to have on a syllabus. Um, a participation policy that is different than an attendance policy. So be thinking in your head, what does participation mean? So I'm thinking about some of my, uh, some of our HPSS GAs. I mean, participation is a little bit easier in an activity class, right? Either you dress out and do the activity or you don't. But what if you have a student who gets injured halfway through the class but wants to stay in the class? What are other ways that you can create participatory activities for them? Um, you know, for all of the rest of you, what are, what does good participation in a discussion mean? How are you going to grade that? All of those things are worth thinking and then communicating to students. Um, what is your grading? Uh, what are your grading policies? Okay, what, what's the grade breakdown? Um, what happens if they miss an exam or an assignment? What's the policy for that? And then, of course, academic honesty. Um, I like to call it academic honesty, not dishonesty, because I like to think that most students are, 99.9% .9 of our students are academically honest, right? But every once in a while, we have a little bit of an issue. Um, and so really flesh out what that means. I think one of the things um, in terms of academic honesty that probably has been the biggest in my career has been students working on projects together. Um, so a student, there might be a little bit of confusion, and I did say earlier that I make my students do lots of projects together, but there's been a little confusion sometimes about when we turn in an assignment and it's a co-created assignment, um, who does it and who does what? And so I have created some boundaries and some guidelines for students to know um, what is the academically honest way for you to collaborate and then to cite each other and to make sure that um, your work is actually being represented in an honest way. Any questions on policies and procedures? Okay. And then last, student support resources. Um, you should include you must include at least one student support resource, and that's our uh, American, our ADA statement, our American with Disabilities Act statement. That is a required piece on your syllabus. Um, we are required as faculty members to accommodate uh, students who have disabilities in our classes. And if a student does 
have a disability or needs an accommodation, um, it is their responsibility to go to our ADA office, talk to our ADA professionals, create that accommodation, and then work with the faculty member. And they'll actually have a, a piece of paper that says, you know, I have an accommodation for this, that, or the other. These are the things that I need. And then you can work together to create what is a reasonable accommodation for that student in that class. Um, obviously, always making sure that you're protect protecting that student's privacy. Um, when talking about that, if you need to make accommodations for a student in a testing situation, um, not saying out loud, um, well, uh, John needs to, John, you're going to go across the hall to take your test now, you know, so just make sure that you're attentive to those types of things. But there are Carrie, lots. Yes, please, Sheldon. Finish, and then I have a question for you on this. You know what? Go for it. Okay. So when I was teaching adjunct last summer, or this, you know, just summer course, I had a student who insisted that they had ADA accommodations. I never got the paper. Mm -hmm. What would be your advice in that situation? It's mm -hmm. a great question, Sheldon. I appreciate it. Um, my advice would be to contact the Office of Disability Services, Karina mason Roris, and I can provide you with Karina's information to ask to say, this student has uh, communicated to me that he or she uh, needs an accommodation. I need the, I, I, can you please send me the formal official accommodations that, that student has worked out with you um, so that we can move forward with that. That is, and, and it's okay to tell the student, I, if you can't provide it, I'll reach out to the office and, and I can get, you know, maybe you lost your sheet somewhere and, and I can, can get that information. That would be my suggestion. And I would open it up to others in the room who have had similar situations for their thoughts. Just a thought would be to provide err on the side of providing the accommodations, if at all possible, until you receive that documentation. Of course, within a reasonable, you know, there's there's got to be some kind of a reasonability in there, but I would do my best to provide those accommodations until I knew otherwise. A great point, right? Because you might not have those right at your fingertips and that student might need that accommodation right away. So yeah, err on the side of trusting the student, but knowing that you are going to need that documentation, you know, one of the things that I didn't know when I was a new faculty member was that the Office of Disability Services will also, they'll provide um, interpretation services for a student who may have, may uh, be hard of hearing um, or in our DHS, DHS deaf and hard of hearing, excuse me, community. Um, or if a student has a, a physical accommodation and needs a different chair, they can provide that to you. That is not the responsibility always of the department, but the Office of Disability Services can, can absolutely help with some of those physical accommodations as well. So they're a great partner. Um, I love what Dr. Brinkerhoff said, err on the side of you know, working with the student to make them as comfortable um, and as you know, set up for success as possible, but knowing that you're gonna need that in a timely manner. Great. So um, other statements, meant there are mental health statements. These are not required. Um, we have a support for veteran students statements. Um, we are a veteran sanctuary at ISU, which means we are very veteran friendly. Um, and so our Veterans Student Services Center has created a support for veteran student statement. Um, we have a success center, which provides tutoring um, for math and for English um, for, for students. So that's another resource for you. Central Academic Advising, we have a career center. And I'm just gonna click on this just very quickly. Um, this is a little bit small. Let's see if I can make it bigger. Um, this was the document that I shared with you earlier, and you're gonna see it's got draft as a watermark. So this is not totally finalized, um, but the Office of Academic Affairs is working on this right now. In this uh, document, you're going to see a number of links to policies that you can simply just take. They've been vetted by ISU, they've been vetted by the deans. You can take and you can put them on your syllabus if you choose. So academic integrity, 
Here's our reasonable, this is the required statement, reasonable accommodation for students with disabilities policy. And we have um, disability services locations on both our Pocatello, our Meridian, and also our Idaho Falls campus, but that's provided by Pocatello, so you would contact them. And then here are some other policies. We have a university attendance policy, a, a, an example of a late work policy, and you can go through these um, and sort of pick and choose what you'd like to put on your syllabi. Again, I'm gonna sound like a broken record, but check with your department chair about the policies that your department has deemed most important for the students in your program. Make sure to include those. So before we wrap up with what happens if I have a student issue, I just wanna see if there are any other questions on the syllabi. I hope you all have as much fun putting together a syllabus as I do, because I think it's really fun. It's fun to think about organizing and planning your class. Um, but if you do have any questions, always happy to help and answer those. So what if you have a student issue? Um, and you, you probably will have a student issue. Those of you who've been teaching for a long time, you know you will have a student issue. Um, student issues, generally speaking, are pretty mild. Um, so if a student has a concern or an issue or um, something that's frustrating them, the advice that I always give to new faculty or any faculty, and I have to give it to myself, is the first thing you do, speak with the student. Okay? Typically, we can resolve things really informally with students. I think 95% of the issues that um, have caused students frustration um, or confusion is maybe just miscommunication, a misunderstanding about an assignment, or maybe it was an email that they thought they sent, but then they didn't send, you know, something like that. Um, try to resolve that issue informally as much as possible. If you feel that the issue is escalating, I do always suggest that you at least keep records of your conversations and your emails. So if, for example, um, you have a student who you believe has engaged in academic dishonesty, um, any way you can kind of keep record of the conversation you have with the student is a good thing. Um, that's not necessarily um, being litigious, uh, but it will help you if the uh, problem escalates to a, a greater, um, sort of a greater level. And it will help if, you know, that student, um, you know, if you need some backup to show that you tried to work with the student, you did ask the student those types of things. So keep records of conversations and emails as you see appropriate. Um, but the really big thing here is make sure you always reach out to the department chair. Not every concern from a student is gonna be uh, needing to reach out to the department chair, but if you really start to feel like something's escalating or a student, you're concerned about a student, always make sure your chair just knows. Uh, she can provide you, he or she can provide you with some guidance, some resources, but also if again that issue escalates, they're going to need to be the people to really help you work through the process. Um, so reach out to your department chair. Um, from the faculty, COE faculty, anything else about uh, student issues? I, I wish I could tell you that all student issues were the same. I've dealt with many and they're all very different. So every student issue is kind of like a little different problems to solve. But are there any other activities um, that the faculty in the College of Ed might think would be helpful when handling student issues? Don't react immediately. I get in trouble for that more than anything else. I find I do better if I wait a day or a day and a half and make sure I don't react immediately. That's fantastic advice. And I think um, I think reacting immediately uh, can do two things. It can escalate something that maybe doesn't need to be escalated, or maybe it's you need to figure out really what's the problem here, right? So give yourself a little bit of breathing room. Um, most of the time, it is not an emergency. So uh, you have good support in the college. You have good support in your departments uh, with student issues. Couple other things. Um, there is an informal and formal complaints process uh, for the teaching and educational studies department. And this is so for those of you who are in other departments, um, I don't know that there is documented evidence, 
or excuse me, a documented process. But for those of you who are teaching in the test departments um, for our, uh, our candidates, our teacher education candidates, if they have a complaint, there's a process to follow. And I've linked you to this process here. Okay, so if you need that, um, make sure you do that. And just be knowledgeable of the support you have across campus. Um, there is a link to lots of ISU faculty and staff resources right here. Um, there is a student handbook, an ISU student handbook that um, certainly you don't need to read this, but it's helpful to know what the students, what the expectations are laid out for the students. Um, that's for the ISU student handbook is for undergrads. The ISU graduate student catalog is the handbook for graduate students. So it's a little bit different. And then of course, if ever there's a Title IX problem, um, disabilities, uh, ADA accommodation issue, um, we have a fantastic Office of Equity and Inclusion too, which you can always call for um, support and uh, for information. And then my last slide for you today before I open it up for questions is just some ISU policies um, for student issues. Um, there is a, an academic integrity and dishonesty policy for undergraduate students in the ISU undergraduate catalog. It's different for graduate students, that's in the graduate catalog. Um, we have an attendance policy and other course policies that are laid out in the ISU undergraduate catalog as well. But as I've said many times before, please always make sure to link to department specific policies. I knew I had one more slide. I'm not going to go through this, but these are some of the ISU policies. There are department level policies, college level policies, and ISU level policies. Um, that some of you might want to review uh, official student absence policy, student code of conduct. They're sort of laid out policies for you to be aware of. Um, one last thing that I want you all to know is my ISU is the web page where you're going to access all of your faculty information. It's going to be how you're going to input grades, how you're going to get your faculty schedule, those types of things. So if you haven't been on my ISU, make sure you connect with your department chair. But here you're going to see an academic calendar. This is going to tell you when midterms are, when final exams are. So make sure as you're putting your syllabi together that you're attending to that academic calendar for the fall semester um, and make sure you're hitting those dates. This is where you're going to grade uh, your students at the end of the semester and also at midterms if that's required in your class. And then any information you need as an employee, um, if you're traveling, those kinds of things, all of that's going to be on my ISU. So if you haven't checked out my ISU, it's a great resource um, and your department chairs can help you access that. So that concludes a whole lot of talking by me. Um, and I apologize for that. But um, what questions do you have? It can be questions related to what we've talked about or any other questions, burning questions you've been thinking about either during this presentation or before. So I have a really good friend who tells me, and I know you've all heard this, that you have to wait 20 seconds before you start talking, you know, after you ask the question. It's very hard for me because I'm a talker. Well, Dr. Curry, Sheldon, Dr. Lynn, Anything else that you'd like to share, or Dr. Jacobson, anything else you'd like to share or add um, to help everybody start successfully this semester? I would just, I would just say, Karen, you know, as a department chair, um, I'm just gonna echo what you said. I would much, much rather have you ask me a question than have to figure out how to solve a situation. It's just so much easier to ask up front and it's my job to answer the questions. And um, so don't hesitate. I, I mean, all of the department chairs, I think uh, all four of us are very accessible and we all want things to go smoothly for everybody. But really, if you, I know you all have faculty that you work with, that's, you know, somebody that you probably knew that kind of brought you on, but they don't always know what the policies and stuff are. So if there's questions, it's always best to go to the department chair and let us be able to give you the right answers. 
Um, not that you would get the wrong answers, but just make sure because policies change quickly sometimes. So please, 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 please come to us and ask us if you have questions and we'll get you taken care of. Thanks, Dr. Curry. That's so important. Your chairs really are there for your support and they will be there to help you through whatever, whatever, whatever problems you have. Um, so not only helping you, but it's helpful for them to know as well. Um, because when problems occur in a classroom or a department, the chair is always the one who, who manages that situation. So we're very lucky to have them, but we have to keep them informed of what's happening in our classes. Well, I wanna thank you all for sharing an hour and a half of your time during an incredibly busy time of the year. So um, hopefully this was helpful for you and it, my pleasure um, for uh, you know putting this together. I, I very much love working with new faculty, um, love working with adjuncts. So uh, if you ever have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, this presentation, the recording of the presentation, if you'd like the recording, I can send that to you. Um, but the presentation documents, the links to all of the resources are all on your Google calendar. So please feel free to kind of um, look around those pieces. And I'll be sending you information throughout the year, as, as uh, Dean Natuli mentioned, um, and getting your thoughts and sort of picking your brains and uh, getting your guidance on what type of information we need to continue to share with, um, to, with our adjuncts to make sure that your teaching experience is as successful as possible in the future. So good luck. Um, I'm grateful to have you as my colleagues and take care. Dr. Appleby, I just have a question about the link to the academic calendar. Sure. It may be me, but when I link to it, it opens up the student code of conduct. Oh. Okay, thank you. I will, I obviously have the wrong link there and I will change that right away. I appreciate that, thank you. Thank you, Christy. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, see you all soon.